Good morning, everybody, or afternoon, wherever you are. And thank you for joining us at the sixth high level industry science government dialogue on Atlantic interactions hosted by the Air Center. My name is Sally Yozell, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. I'm a senior fellow and director of the Environmental Security Program at the Stimson Center in Washington, DC. And previously I served as a senior advisor for ocean issues at the US Department of State and Director of Policy at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration or NOAA. During that time, I helped develop the US national ocean policy, including the policies related to marine spatial planning or as some call it, ocean planning. In today's session, we will focus on marine spatial planning or MSP as a tool for ensuring clean and productive coastal zones to sustain biodiversity and the blue economy. This panel is co-organized with the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. So as everyone knows, the ocean is critical for our economic, environmental, and food security. It is the largest provider of protein in the world, sustaining up to 3 billion people who depend on seafood as their primary source of protein. It's also responsible for trade, transport, and communications around the world. And it supports an estimated 1.5 trillion US dollars in global economic activity. However, the demand for marine goods and services such as food, energy is increasing. And this demand is on a trajectory to exceed the capacity of marine ecosystems, which can cause competition and conflict. So marine resources are common resources and ocean planning is designed to avoid the tragedy of the commons. As defined by UNESCO Marine Spatial Planning, it's a public process that's designed to analyze and replicate human activities in green areas based on spatial and temporal distribution, while also achieving ecological, economic, and social objectives that are usually specified through some sort of a political process. So marine spatial planning enables stakeholders to work together and organize the use of ocean space across a variety of human uses, from fisheries to aquaculture, shipping, tourism, oil and gas, renewable energy, et cetera, as well as, we can't forget this, as well as the health of the marine environment. And this is really key because a healthy marine ecosystem adds value to a healthy blue economy, both of which are essential to achieving SDG 14, life below the water. So when we think about it in our fast paced world today, the ocean, activities in it change over time. So to accommodate this, marine special planning needs to be ongoing and an iterative process that requires periodic review and adaptation. I think it's fair to say that most of us have grown up with the concept of land use planning, the process to allocate areas of land for certain uses. For example, nature parks or industrial zones, agriculture, residential, or even business centers. This same concept can be applied to marine areas, but getting there requires really a shift from the antiquated kind of stovepiped approaches that have been employed in ocean decision making in the past. We need to be more integrated and have a more holistic perspective. One that integrates ecosystem scientific information with policy decisions while incorporating expert insights from stakeholders. It's estimated that at minimum 13 nations have approved marine plans and experts anticipate that in the next five years at least 70 countries will have approved plans and new discussions are focusing also on the high seas. That said, with all political processes, divergent interests and trade-offs exist. You know, managing marine resources in an era of unprecedented climate change, population growth, and rising demand is paramount if we're going to safeguard the ocean in this decade of science. 
So to discuss all of these issues, we really have a great panel today. And let me please introduce all of them. First, we have Michelle Casada, who is the regional coordinator at MSP Global Initiative, which seeks to implement the priority actions of the joint roadmap to accelerate marine spatial planning processes worldwide. This was adopted in 2017 by the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, IOC, UNESCO, as well as the European Connect, European Commission, sorry. Um, Michelle will be presenting on ecosystem-based marine spatial planning and the role of IOC UNESCO on promoting ecosystem-based marine spatial planning. Next, we'll hear from Mr. Juan Ronco. Juan is a policy officer at the European Commission's Directorate for General Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, and his main responsibilities are marine spatial planning. He will be presenting on marine spatial planning in the EU with a focus on how MSP can support the EU's Green Deal initiative. Then we're going to hear from Marta Virgilio, a researcher and program manager at the Regional Fund for Science in the Azores. She will be presenting on the importance of framing and of cross-border cooperation in marine spatial planning. She'll be followed by Tammy Warren, who is the Senior Marine Resource Officer for the Bermuda government, Department of Environment and Natural Resources. In this role, Tammy leads a team responsible for management of all marine resources within Bermuda's 200 nautical miles or EEZ. Dr. Warren will be speaking on the stakeholder engagement and GIS applications in marine spatial planning in Bermuda. And then our final speaker is Mandy Lombard, Board, Mandy Lombard. She's a professor of marine spatial planning at Nelson Mandela University in South Africa. She focuses on applied research that can be implemented for effective, sustainable outcomes. Her current areas of focus include the Western Indian Ocean, the Southern Ocean, and Antarctica. And she'll be speaking today on marine spatial planning for Algoa Bay in South Africa. Each of our panelists will have about 10 minutes, and then we're gonna follow up with an open session for questions and answers. So let me just remind our viewers that you will see a chat box um, that you can send questions into. And you can, also, don't forget to, on the Zoom, um, you can have a live chat. I mean, excuse me, you'll see a live chat. And then um, after we're finished, after our time is allotted, we'll have an opportunity to continue for another 30 minutes in a breakout session. And there will be a new Zoom link that comes up in your chat box. So pre please go to that so you can have a further conversation with our amazing panelists. So with that, let me turn it over um, to our first speaker, Michelle. Thank you, Sally. I will start sharing my screen. Could you please confirm that you can see? Perfect, thank you. So on behalf of the MSP Global Initiative of IOC UNESCO, I would like to thank Sally, the Atlantic International Research Center and all organizers of this All Atlantic Summit. So as Sally mentioned, I will focus my presentation today on ecosystem-based MSP and I would like to really focus on the ecosystem-based concept today. And I will talk about this concept and the role of IOC UNESCO of promoting marine spatial planning through our storytelling. So let's start in 2005, when only nine countries had MSP process in place. So this means that less than 1% of the exclusive economic zones were covered by some kind of initiative. Then during this same year, the member states of IOC UNESCO uh, requested the inclusion of MSP on the agenda of the institution. Uh, we were already working with integrated coastal area management but there was this need of clear guidelines about planning and management the area beyond the coastal zone, the, all the maritime jurisdiction area of the countries. So in 
So in 2006, uh, IELTS UNESCO organized the first international conference on MSP. And during this conference, they invited experts compile the few MSP cases already in place, the good practice from these uh, examples, and emerged this famous definition that Sally mentioned, uh, which defines MSP as this public process of analyzing allocation of special and safer distribution of human activities to achieve ecological, economic, and social objectives. Then in the coming years, what happens is that uh, MSP developed a series of guidelines to support the member states on developing this kind of planning process. And uh, the most used one is the step-by-step -step approach towards uh, ecosystem-based management, which was published in 2009. And if we look at these guidelines, we will see that the authors decided to uh, divide MSP in 10 steps. But here I would like to highlight that these are not a recipe that you follow a step after the other, and then at the end, all country will have the same cake. No, it's not like this. These steps are indeed elements, components, aspects that are important, that are important during the development of the MSP process. And today, since uh, my focus is on ecosystem-based approach, I'd like to highlight the step five. Why? Because it's during this step that the countries uh, assess the existing conditions of the maritime uses of the ecosystem. And it's very important here to change from the sectoral perspective that we were used to where you, when you you usually do for example environmental impact assessment of a specific projects for specific sectors to change it for a more integrated view when you will also analyze the cumulative impacts of the different sectors that happen in the same area so in summary, what uh, IOC UNESCO is trying to do is to support ecosystem-based policies, both integrated coastal area management for the coastal zone and marine special planning for the entire, entire maritime jurisdiction of the country. And what's the ecosystem approach for MSP? It's about integration. It's about improving institutional coordination empower all stakeholders having a multi-sector approach, protect the coastal and marine ecosystems, the seascapes and the cultural heritage, enhance the compatibility between development and conservation, increase public awareness and capacity development on MSP in order to achieve a sustainable blue economy. So the, the key word here is integration and integration in terms of methods of analysis, of analyzing uh, all the sectors in an integrated way, but also in terms of understanding, understanding that in, we are integrated to the ecosystem. So after this first phase of 12 years from 2005 to 2017, how was the process, the progress? Quite a lot from less than 1% to 10% of the exclusive economic zones under some type of uh, MSP process, but it's still not enough. So during the same year, uh, UNESCO joined forces with the European Commission and they organized the second international MSP conference. So different countries presented a status of MSP or the challenge to start implementing MSP. So with this in mind, both institutions, in order to uh, support the Sustainable Development Goal 14 of the Agenda 2030, decided to launch the joint roadmap to accelerate marine special planning worldwide. We call it MSP Roadmap. And this roadmap has five priority actions. 
So the idea is to uh, in, uh, stimulate discussions and also implementation of a MSP process that consider transboundary MSP, sustainable blue economy, ecosystem-based approach that also promotes capacity building between the, among the different stakeholders that needs to be engaged in the MSP process and mutual understanding. Everybody needs to understand what is MSP in order to be part of the process. And as all of you, we also had to adapt our activities to this pandemic situation. And despite of the challenge, this was also an opportunity for us. So many of our capacity development activities that were face-to-face -face had to be changed for online activities. And whenever possible, what we are doing is to um, implement these activities online, open to the public audience. And here I brought an example for, from one of these activities when the focus was exactly the ecosystem-based approach for MSP. So this is uh, one uh, slide of a colleague from the University of Aveiro in Portugal that brought to us what are the critical factors today for decision-making based on the ecosystems. So this speaker, for example, highlighted six main aspects the environmental status. So here we need to consider the ecosystem services. We need to consider the good environmental status. The second aspect would be the integration of the maritime sectors towards a sustainable blue economy. The third point, to not forget to address risk and climate change. When we are talking about planning, we are talking about the future and climate change is a reality. And if you want to have a plan that is useful for the coming 10, 20 years, it needs to take into account climate change. Another aspect, we need to improve monitoring of the maritime activities and the status of the environment. And for that, it's very important to promote scientific, technical and traditional knowledge. It's important to have capacity development about everything, all type of knowledge that is important for MSP. If it's about data, if it's about governance, it's about how to engage stakeholders, all this is important. And last, but uh, the most important cooperation. It's impossible to develop a marine special planning process and to achieve an MSP plan at the end of the process if there's no cooperation. So it's important to have cooperation between the stakeholders at the local, at national level, but also cooperation between neighboring countries. So where we are now? So nowadays, these are preliminary results. We are conducting a survey with our member states and we have about 76 countries uh, that have already st at least started a MSP process. So this means about 15% of the exclusive economic zones. The goal of the SDG 14 is one third. So we have 10 years to achieve our common goal of improving these numbers. So just to finalize, I would like to say that uh, IOC UNESCO will keep supporting its member states to achieve uh, ecosystem-based marine special planning. And uh, during these 10 years, we also have the UN OSHA decade, decade and scientific knowledge is very important to promote marine special planning. So my last sentence is, in order to have a clean and productive coasts, base, estuaries, and the ocean, we need an ecosystem-based marine special plan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was a great overview. And now we're turning it over to Juan. Uh, Juan, turn off. Your, yeah, there you yes. go. Yes, hello, here I am, yeah. 
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sally. And um, I would say thanks to Michelle for this um, great introduction to MSP, to the main tenets of MSP, and to for, for this global vision of uh, what's happening in MSP. From my side, what I will do is, is focus on the EU. So um, for this, I will now present some, some um, uh, slides. I hope you can see them. Um, so the, um, I will talk about maritime special planning in the European Union. And I will start with um, a very um, um, specific, uh, I would say message. And that is that maritime special planning, as you said, Sally, in the, in the introduction, is, is there to support what we call in the European, European Union, the Green Deal. So this, this kind of response uh, by the EU to the, uh, to the challenges that are posed by climate change, but other challenges um, that are coming up. Um, and I will take a very specific example of how is this happening, um, what MSP is doing. So if you take, for instance, uh, the, the aim or the objective to supply clean energy, clean and affordable energy um, to European Union citizens, then um, you, will, you will see that you need space. Um, the ocean is 70% of the planet, but only 5% of the ac economic activity. So there is still room for some more, I would say, economic activity in the marine environment, in the marine domain. Um, you see here what could the evolution of the, of, of the offshore wind energy look like in the coming years. So if we, if we want to, um, to have a decarbonized uh, economy, we will need more and more renewable energy and uh, offshore wind energy can offer, of course, a, a, an answer to that. Um, if you see, you see there a map of, of Europe and you see what this deployment could be in terms of gigawatts at Horizon 2050, to reach the objectives that the European Union has set for itself. We have also the UK, the United Kingdom, which is no longer a member, but which is also very ambitious in, in this uh, regard. Um, so where can we put this, this um, uh, offshore wind energy installations? Uh, you see uh, there a map and uh, red means that the cost of putting there the installation will be high uh, dark blue means that the cost of putting the installation will be low. So um, we have there then a problem. So where we put these installations, um, because they will, the, the space there, they will compete with other users. Um, this is to give you an, a flavor of um, what does it mean to have uh, um, shallow waters. If you look to the right, you look to Poland, and then you will see in Poland, uh, they will have a very low, relatively low cost of installation. It's called levelized cost of electricity, LCOE. While the Netherlands, they will have perhaps a bit more of a cost um, if they have to share the, um, the space with other activities. Uh, there are other um, types of uh, offshore renewable energy. So not only winds, but we have also, uh, for instance, uh, tidal energy. Uh, currents can be used to produce, uh, to produce um, um, electricity, but this needs all, also space. Um, but there is a, a big potential for that. Look at the uh, Dutch um, Marine Special Plan or Maritime Special Plan, and you will see that they have already um, foreseen zones that will be uh, used for this type of energy. So um, when planning, you need a long-term perspective. You have to look for multi-use. You have to look for grids, this means cables, and also the supply chain. So you, you will need to, to have ports uh, supporting this, these installations. Um, so this means also space, basically. So you see that there is, um, there is a, because this could be, um, this could become a, a big discussion, um, big debate among, among uh, users of the sea. And we are seeing it now, some fishermen are becoming a bit nervous about uh, this, this 
possible massive deployment of offshore wind energy. So what is maritime special planning? I think that Michelle uh, already explained to us what is it, what is it. Um, for the European Union, it's about of uh, integration and coherence um, to make this the use of the of the ocean sustainable. Why MSP? You see, there are a few reasons why we need MSP. Um, they were mentioned before, but for instance, to reduce conflicts, um, to improve certainty of investments. That's also very important reasons and to protect the environment. So to reduce cumulative um, impact of maritime activities in the environment. Um, what did the EU? So in 2014, the EU member states and the European Parliament adopted what we call a, a directive. This is a framework law, which then has to be translated into national legislation, into national law. Um, the, the basic aim of the directive is to do things together. So to do maritime, maritime special planning together to cooperate. Um, member states, so each country does its own thing, its own maritime, maritime, maritime special plan or marine special plan. But there is a framework, as I said, there are minimum requirements for these plans. And there is also a framework uh, to support the deployment of uh, the plans or the, the establishments of the plans. Um, the directive entered into force in 2014. 2016 member states had to translate this framework law into their national law. And then by 2021, March the 31st is the deadline to establish the plans. So member states have committed themselves to establish this, these plans by next March next year. The coverage is basically the exclusive economic zone of the of the member states. So, what are the key requirements for um, for these maritime special plans at EU level or EU EU style? I would say, I mean, these are basic requirements which uh, Michelle also presented. So, you have to involve stakeholders, stakeholders or participation. Um, use best available data, for instance. Uh, uh, take into account landscape interactions. Of course, ecosystems-based approach, cross-border cooperations that, that's in the DNA of the European Union. And, um, and then um, we have to, um, to see that we have um, this maritime special plan ready. I, I, here are examples of maritime special plans. This is the German one for the North Sea. This is the Belgian maritime special plan, very detailed ones. We got Latvia, uh, Maritime Special Plan, um, the Netherlands. And then this is the Netherlands, uh, what the Netherlands could, lo could look like in 2120. So um, you will see that there is quite a lot happening at, uh, at sea, but also that is the, the, even the, what is happening at land is quite a lot. So the, the, the landscape will change, in fact. In the EU, we are, ha we are having fun with maritime special planning. So the EU funded a game, the MSP Challenge 250, which you can do, play uh, on, on a board, but you can also play it on computer. So very, very exciting way to do MSP. This is a, a, a slide giving an overview of the projects, as we call them, that the EU is financing, is supporting in the um, European Union and beyond. And you will see um, that in the Atlantic, there is quite a lot happening. Uh, you see there on the bottom uh, left, the project MAR-SP, Macaronesian Mar Special Planning. I think Marta will talk about this. So quite a lot of uh, cooperation, projects are cooperating, doing things together. MSP is part of the EU, EU's Atlantic Strategy and Action Plan. This is a broader strategy for the Atlantic. And uh, it has several pillars. And for goal six, uh, is a stronger coastal resilience and MSP is uh, an essential, essential part of it. So what, what are we doing? We are also doing studies as we call them. So uh, presenting evidence on maritime special plan. We did, it, uh, we did a study on economic impacts of MSP, which was presented together with, uh, with um, IOC UNESCO. We are doing a study work on the integration of the ecosystems-based approach. 
and also on the assessment, monitoring, and revision of maritime special plans. Because one day you have to, you will have to monitor and you have, will have to review or revise your maritime special plan. We are doing also outreach and, and, and we have tools to support planners. So here you see, this is the, um, what we call the European MSP platform website, uh, which provides quite a lot of uh, material for planners. Uh, this is a kind of repository of documents and a kind of repository of information, which uh, you can also consult. So I invite you to do that. Um, and then to end, I would, I would like to show you two examples of EU-funded tools for MSP. This one is the EMOTNET uh, Human Activities Portal, where you can see, for instance, what, where wind energy is being located. The other one is an example of a tool to visualize uh, the Baltic Sea Maritime Special Plans. It's called the Base Maps. So that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Juan. That was fantastic. Um, excellent presentation um, to hear what's going on with the EU Commission and all the member states. Um, now we'll hear from Marta Virgilio. Marta. Um, good morning. Juan, if you could take down your... Um, yeah. Your, thank you. Sorry. Okay, so I will start sharing my screen. I hope you are able to see it already. Um, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, also. Um, I'm here to present a case study uh, regarding the implementation of the Maritime Spatial Plan um, processes. Um, and this was developed under the Mars project, uh, the Macaronesian Maritime Spatial Planning. Uh, the project um, addressed three regions, the, the Azores and Madeira in Portugal, and also the Canary Islands in, the, um, in Spain. Um, the three regions are outermost regions uh, from the European Union. They, they all share the same sea basin. They have social and ecological connections and they also share common challenges. Um, the Mars project was structured in seven work packages uh, and delivered um, 93 products. And in this presentation, I will focus on the scenarios uh, development involving stakeholder engagement and also the Macronesian cross-border cooperation. Um, so I will start with the, the manual of scenarios for maritime special planning in the Azores. Um, it started by setting MSP objectives based on policy review, um, including le legal and regulatory instruments um, at different scales. So we, we addressed international uh, instruments, European, national and regional instruments. Um, with the objective to categorize also these objectives in environmental, social and economic issues um, to allow a stakeholder consultation. Um, the, the objectives um, were also um, addressed to identify the most uh, significant based on a consultation with regional experts. So these experts scored each objective based on its perceived contribution in achieving a good, state, a good state and to frame the storylines of scenarios for the Azores. Uh, this was the, a table uh, with the, all the scores to each objective. Um, and then we developed the scenario storylines um, with the three uh, scenarios for the Azores. Um, so in the year 2030, the Blue Society scenarios, um, Azorean society has a clear commitment to the sea recognizing its contribution in the, in the identification and character construction for the Azorians. Under the blue growth scenario, Azorian economy has a clear, effective and increasing participation from maritime activities, assuming that the preservation of environmental balance and the marine resources is compatible with its exploitation. And under the blue development, um, the development of the Azores is intrinsically linked to the sea and there is an harmonious balance between the exploitation of resources, the marine environment and its preservation. 
Um, the following step included the balancing across scenarios based on feedback from stakeholders' engagement actions. And we actually tried to co-develop co with stakeholders uh, one participated scenario. And this process was developed in different stages. So the stakeholders first vote on the preferred scenario. Um, then uh, it was constructed the participated scenario storyline based on the sentences that constituted each, uh, each scenario storyline. Um, and also we, we managed to, to have a discussion to reach consensus on the compatibility, coherence and attainability of statements of each participated scenario. So uh, here it is important to, to note that um, stakeholders vote for uh, the blue development, but when they were analyzing the sentences characterizing each stakeholder, um, they also selected uh, several sentences from the, the blue growth scenario. Um, now I will address the policy recommendations coming from the cross-border analysis. Um, and here the main idea um, that was developed by our colleagues from the University of Cadiz, who actually uh, mainly developed this task, was the concept of the European Macaronesian Ocean. So the mission was mainly to promote coherence between marine plants through coordination in the entire marine region. Uh, under this concept, the European Macaronesian Ocean, um, this, the, the, the ocean is seen as a shared sea with common elements in the ecosystem, socio-cultural and political administrative dimensions, um, to cooperate from what binds us together and from the European principles of integration, rethinking borders as spaces of union, not separation from which we seek a joint vision, um, seeking coherence between MSP plans, um, always respecting the different interests and singularities, we, but without forgetting that our future is connected, and also reinforcing the role of both states, adding forces in the future of an outermost region, distant and separated from the rest of the European borders. Um, also, the, the European Macaronesia um, is seen as a socio-ecosystem. The common conditions of insularity and isolation have a high impact on the social and economic development of the three archipelagos. Um, the regions have different MSP processes um, in different stages and the marine governance frameworks to, ma to manage a common sea basin. Uh, and also main MSP competent authorities at the national and regional scale for European Macaronesia. Um, the Macaronesia already has some mechanisms to promote cross-border cooperation, has agreements, treaties and community regulations, um, bilateral agreements, joint projects, and non-permanent mechanisms, including spaces for dialogue to agree on long-term common policies and uh, promote common interest uh, of the parties. And also, there is already a consensus among maritime stakeholders of the Azores, Madeira and Canary Islands. Um, the main key policy recommendations that uh, were identified under the, the project and this task was to focus on the relationships and processes that transverse the sea basin in order to understand the context of the European Ocean of the Macaronesia, agree on a common future for the sea basin, together we are stronger to face shared challenges, establish a joint and specific governance framework for MSP cross-border cooperation, work with the possibilities of the governance context, um, exploit the existing mechanisms for cooperation, adopt flexible approaches to define transboundary cooperation areas around common interests, begin with the easiest to overcome inertia, engage people to create political and social will, support cooperation through best available knowledge to improve decision-making, and also invest to create a profitable European ocean of, the, of Macaronesia. Um, this task also delivered the pilot program for cross-border cooperation, um, which included uh, different strategic goals and identified different lines of action, for example, to provide resources for cross-border cooperation, 
the strategic action is to to develop a training system in marine governance, uh, which includes training programs and training meetings for managers on MSP. Um, I will be available for any question to if you if you want to. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. That was excellent, Marta. Um, thank you for uh, giving us uh, an overview on uh, MARSP from the Azores and other areas, uh, really focusing so much on shared borders, shared challenges, um, working together, common incentives, all those, that was very, very good. Okay, so um, our next uh, speaker will be Tammy Warren. Um, so Tammy, if you could take it away, please. Yeah, thanks, Sally. I'll just share my screen here. Very happy to be with you all. And um, I'm going to be um, just outlining the marine spatial planning process at Bermuda. And I'm just talking specifically all about the stakeholder engagement that we're doing and the GIS applications that we're using in, in the process. So a brief introduction to um, our marine spatial planning program. So last year, the government announced the formation of uh, the Bermuda Ocean Prosperity Program. And the goal of this program was to, is to support sustainable growth of marine industries, activities, and resources um, in Bermuda. And the government has also pledged to fully protect 20% of our EEZ through this program. So Bermuda has a number of spatial measures. Um, most of them are located on our reef platform, which is about 750 square kilometers. Um, some of them were, were um, created to uh, avoid you know, conflict between users, such as the dive sites here in, in yellow. Um, these are no fishing areas. And some date back to the 60s, such as the Coral Reef Preserve, um, which was, which was made to protect the corals and organisms attached to the bottom, but now we protect all coral in Bermuda, so it probably needs to be reviewed. Uh, this is also a very busy area, um, a, lot of, a lot of users, and um, so we need a comprehensive plan to manage the use in this area. And we also need a clear process for considering marine development, um, such as renewable energy. But Bermuda also has um, 200 nautical miles um, around the island um, to manage, and that's 465,000 square kilometers. And other than shipping, there's not a whole lot of um, economic activity out there. Most of the activity is on the Bermuda platform there and to um, offshore, offshore banks. So the BOP program is what we call the Bermuda Ocean Prosperity Program. We'll be also looking at this whole area, you know, what economic activity may be um, taking place in the future and um, have a management plan for this whole area. So the main pillars of work are the marine spatial planning, and we will be developing and uh, legally adopt an enforceable, comprehensive, easy-wide marine spatial plan. Um, and complementary um, projects are the blue economy strategy. And so Bermuda is looking to diversify our, our economy and strengthen sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth and improved livelihoods and jobs and also ecosystem health. And we also have the Sustainable Fisheries Project, uh, which we're looking to improve fisheries management where appropriate and support Bermuda's fisheries goals, including implementation of a fish aggregation device pilot project. So the whole project is um, guided by a steering committee, and that steering committee is made up of um, relevant government departments, 
uh, boards and committees, and also quasi-government agencies. It's supported by a BOP administrative team, which I'm a part of, and they contain other officers of the principal organizations. It's also supported by a science advisory committee, and the science advisory committee was um, responsible for vetting various types of data, um, including ecological data, biophysical, and socioeconomic data. And the science committee has also drafted uh, principles, goals, and objectives, conservation objectives for the program that have already been approved by the steering committee. But of course, stakeholder engagement in marine spatial planning is extremely important. And we are now just embarking on our uh, public consultation. So we, have, we were, are looking to engage the general public, um, but we're also gonna be forming um, ocean village groups, as we call it, stakeholder focus groups. And of course, this whole, uh, the plan will ultimately be approved by the Bermuda cabinet. Um, so we had our virtual public launch just on the 17th of September. And um, we, we had um, a speaker from uh, Portugal, um, Emmanuel Gonçalves from the Oceana Azor Foundation and, uh, and a, a couple of other speakers. And the public was um, encouraged to contact us, um, to learn more about the program, and also to take an ocean use survey, which I will talk about in a couple of minutes. So as I said, we're also looking to engage um, stakeholders in smaller um, focus groups. Um, and we've um, separated the groups into eight thematic groups. So the commercial fishermen, uh, passive recreation and conservation, diving, snorkeling, and swimming, tourism, boating, and sports, utilities, infrastructure, and development, recreational fishermen, and aquaculture or mariculture and wastewater pollution management. These, um, these groups will have about 10 to 12 people in the group. And they, in addition to giving feedback on key issues, they will also be responsible for identifying other people that need to be uh, consulted. And this, these people in these groups were selected uh, by the administrative team. They were self-nominated. And in the case of the commercial fishermen, they were um, recommended by the Fishermen's Association Bermuda. The stakeholder engagement for these focus groups is gonna be in three phases. So as I said, we're now in phase one and those, the groups are getting started they will take the ocean use survey. They will also vet the principles, goals, and objectives that have been uh, drafted by the science committee and approved by the steering committee. And they will also set objectives um, for what they see for what they want to see for their industry. So marine um, use objectives. They'll also be looking at the blue economy um, recommendations that come out of that strategy. Um, and then the second phase will be next year, February to July, um, and they will validate um, the ocean use surveys, which will be collated by that time, and, and also look at the draft MSP. And then the final phase will be in October next year. And they will be then looking and reviewing the final draft MSP and also the, the draft blue economy strategy, which will be complete by that time, hopefully. So 
um, one of the main tools that we are using to bring all of this data together, so data from the um, gathered by the science committee and data from uh, during the uh, stakeholder consultation phase is a GIS package called C-Sketch. So this was developed by Mil Will McClintock um, at the University of California in uh, Santa Barbara for non-GIS professionals like me. So as you see, it has a very easy to use uh, interface and this allows for collaborative planning of ocean spaces. So as you can see on this one, the background um, layers have been already put in. So political boundaries, current spatial measures, ecology, infrastructure, um, some of the human use data that we already have. So this is the uh, first, uh, the welcome page of the ocean use surveys that the ocean village stakeholder groups will be taking. They'll be taking it individually. Um, and, and also the broader public, as I said, has been invited to uh, go onto the site and to, to take this survey. Um, the, the survey access uh, users to identify areas of importance by drawing on the map and indicating the relative value of the areas uh, to them. And here you just see that I've uploaded the current uh, management measures that we have. Um, the, there's an instructional, instructional video and also written instructions for people. And we also have volunteers that will be go, going out and helping people to fill out the surveys. Um, all of this, of course, has to be done within COVID uh, restrictions and guidelines. And here I've just drawn a, um, on the map uh, two areas, as you can see here. Um, these are actually grouper aggregation areas, and I've awarded them 50 points each, so it's out of 100 points. And the second tool that we're using is uh, called Mapsineer, and this was developed in um, Helsinki, Finland. And we added this tool because um, the C-Sketch can only be used by desktop and laptop users. And there are a number of people in Bermuda that use mobile tablets and, and phones. Um, and so this, this doesn't allow you to weight the areas as in C-Sketch. So we will be defaulting to C-Sketch where possible, but we will be asking users um, to, to give an idea of how important this is to them. These, their areas are to them. So finally, um, this is an outline of the whole MSP process. Um, so as I said, the steering committee has approved the draft principles and goals and objectives. We've done the public launch. So we're now in this phase with the stakeholder working groups. Um, all of that feedback will go back to the steering committee who will finalize the principal goals and objectives. And then the modeling will begin to develop the um, marine spatial plan. So public consultation again next July, stakeholder working groups again, and revisions to the MSP, and finally, the final draft plan that will be submitted to government for government to take it through its legal process. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Tammy. That was excellent uh, overview of um, the marine spatial planning process in Bermuda, BOP, love the name. And um, uh, now let us turn it over to our next speaker, um, Mandy Lombard. And Mandy is sharing her screen. Did man Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, just dancing between all my different screens. So hoping that I'm on the right screen. Uh, Sally, could you confirm that that screen is correct? I can see you, but we have not yet have your screen up. I did share screen. So let me just um, go back there. 
Okay, how are we doing now? That looks great. And if you then go to the broad uh, expansion of the screen, perfect. Are we good? Excellent. Okay, well, thank you. Sorry about the technicalities. Um, we're a little bit into wine and evening time here in South Africa. So I'm going to share with you this evening a marine spatial plan that we are developing for a bay in South Africa, which is adjacent to our university. And the difference between this and other things that you might have heard about earlier before is that we're a pro we are using a systems approach to marine spatial planning, which I will share with you right now. So I like to share this slide with students because marine spatial planning is both complicated and complex. And then I ask them to go and read up what is the difference between the two. And one is a more engineering approach, which means there are lots of parts to the problem. And the other speaks to feedbacks, where if you poke one side of the ecosystem, another side will respond in a certain way. So predator-prey relationships are examples of those. So marine spatial planning needs to cross-cut all of the activities that we undertake on our coasts and in the oceans. And this means that we are dealing with a lot of complexity. We're also dealing with possibly conflict and certainly dealing with lots of different departure points and visions that different stakeholders have for their marine areas. So to try to address the, the hugeness of this problem, we have started small. So we have started a research program in our bay, which is here in the bottom right, so the southeast of, of Africa. And it is a very diverse bay, which has both cold upwelling systems and southern ocean systems and the warmer gullus current coming down. So a lot of biodiversity and, of course, a lot of human activity. So we start off by doing a visioning activity or exercise with our stakeholders where we place two different axes. Our one axis speaks to good ocean governance or poor ocean governance. And our other axis speaks to oceans that are either healthy or unhealthy. And one can go through the literature and one can go through examples and find that there are systems that will fall out into all four of these boxes across the planet. And we would like to be in the top right with good governance and good ocean health. And of course, uh, breaching whales in the system. So we adopt a social ecological systems approach where we um, have humans interacting with the oceans and we have all sorts of different activities which have impacts and there are feedback loops between these types of systems. So essentially a social ecological system for those who, who don't know what I'm talking about, these are complex systems, they are adaptive and they are also li linked through feedback mechanisms. Biologists understand this kind of language because ecosystems are inherently, you know, ecological systems. But the human component of these systems is where it starts to get tricky and it starts to get very complex. So a social ecological system is perpetually dynamic, it is complex, and it requires continuous adaptation. So we have developed, in fact, my PhD student, Esti Vermeulen, has developed a system dynamics model in Algoa Bay, where the central variable is what we are calling a marine sustainability index. And we have picked five different sectors to initially just a proof of concept of a model, because one can't include the whole world, whereas the whole world probably does influence the bay. We have picked um, just these five sectors to demonstrate how this tool can work. This is the under the hood version of a system dynamics model. This is in Stellar Architect software, and it is a quantitative model. And of course, you don't have to read it. I just want you to, to understand that we are doing some real science under the hood. Um, along with the modeling goes our stakeholder engagement process, which you've heard quite a lot about in the previous speakers. And this is my colleague, Jai Clifford Holmes, who is helping us as um, sort of university-based biologists to go out there and learn how to engage with the public and how to engage with different sectors. So we have a whole process which is called the Algoa Bay Collaborative Dynamic Modeling Process that we undertake with our stakeholders. I'm going to show you a quick demonstration of how the tool is starting to work. And here we have um, one of the dashboards that we've developed. And we are now going to do a little, just a, a quick look at mariculture and how that 
impacts on our marine sustainability index. So we call these things stories um, to demonstrate to the public that whatever story they have can fit in. And here we're looking at mariculture, we have oysters that are growing out at sea, and we have all of these things that impact the oysters, including water temperature, chlorophyll, pollutants, the rate at which they are harvested, the bacterial quality or levels uh, impacting water quality in the bay. And this then can be run through our model and we can see how all of these factors play out and how they impact one another. So there are four graphs here showing you how the model will run with certain variables input into it. And if it runs that way, then over time, this is what's going to happen to our marine sustainability index. Here it is going down and that is because pollutants have gone up and the harvest rate has also increased. So what is really nice is that these models can be used to demonstrate the impacts of different policies. So we might say, okay, we don't like what's happened to the index. Let's expand the farm. Let's plant more oysters per area. And let's introduce some purification innovations to the water systems. And now let's run the model and see if those policy interventions are having the desired responses or whether these changes are taking us back in the system. And we can then plot again what happens to our marine sustainability index to see if we like those kind of policy interventions or not. Or more importantly, what should we do as an alternate? So the significance of these types of models and this type of work is that it allows us to explore these policy interventions. So it's very much a scenario building tool. It is not a one size fits all. It is not something that is going to give you one answer. It's going to allow you to explore what if scenarios based on the power in the room and who wants what in their particular marine ocean area and who has the power to be able to say how it's going to be. Um, the other significance of these models and the really useful aspect is that stakeholders gain a shared understanding of the system. And I think um, the previous speaker, Tammy, would certainly be able to really um, understand how this is extremely important because without that shared understanding, you're always going to have conflict. And then, of course, these models assist with planning and management going forward. So the outputs of our model will be used in regional plans that are being developed by the country. They are not yet complete, but they are starting. And we want to use this area as a pilot area to be able to demonstrate how collaborative modeling can improve our marine spatial planning efforts. So that's the, those are our websites. That's who we are at the Institute for Coastal and Marine, marine Research at Nelson Mandela University. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to take them. Thank you. You're muted, Sally. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. What fantastic uh, group of presentations from uh, the broad down to the very specific. Um, I think that were incredibly helpful. And in addition, we have already started to get a lot of uh, really great questions. Let me pull them up. Um, so why don't we go through those questions and um, from the audience. Um, our first question is from the United States. And it asks, can one of you give an example of how you've used marine spatial planning to encourage synergies between two maritime uses versus minimizing the impacts from maritime uses? So for example, like fisheries and um, renewable energy, say for example. Maybe Michelle, um, would you like to try to start us off with that one? Uh, I think for the specific plants, I would uh, pass the, the floor to one of the examples they, they gave us. Okay. Would someone, um, either um, Tammy or Mandy or Martha, want to try that?
Can you just uh, repeat the questions? Sandra? Yeah, it's really asking how, when you have, say, for example, um, con not conflict, but two existing um, activities. Sally? Like yes. Uh, sorry, this is Elena. I've been watching carefully. Uh, Marta is representing me because I'm in another place where I have terrible conditions. But for those that want to explore synergies between uses, there's a European project called Multi-Uses, called Muses, which addresses exactly that question. What are the obstacles? What are the synergies? And also in the UMSP platform, you have um, boards and cards for all the uses and their synergies and conflicts with other uses. I don't know if this answers the question. Thank you. Uh, sure. I mean, um, that's great. Maybe you could throw the link up in the chat. Um, uh, that might be a good way of um, sharing that with everyone. And, I, and, I'll, I'll, and I'll ask Marta to do it. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. And so, Tammy, the question was really like looking, for example, at fisheries and renewable energy as an example, just two different uses. And how do you um, get them to benefit from synergies versus conflict? Yes, um, that's a good question. Um, as I said, we're just starting our process, but we do have um, some interest in renewable energy here. And um, we had, had started to look at, um, you know, while maybe certain like the, the farms could be attract, uh, uh, attract fish, so would there be a, a way that we could allow fishermen to, to fish around um, that area somewhat. Um, we're just starting to explore that. I don't know if others, um, Juan talked about renewable energy, um, whether there's um, some other examples of that elsewhere. Thank you, that's excellent. Um, can, I, can I perhaps come in and give some examples uh, on, on this? Sure, Juan, please, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, there are perhaps surprising examples, but um, for instance, in Denmark, um, they are not yet ready with their marit marine special plan or maritime special plan, but they, they have, um, they are identifying areas where uh, tourism could take place or is taking place even um, uh, around or in areas where offshore wind parks are installed. So um, tourists are brought there and they can have a look at the, uh, at the parts, at the installations. Um, this is something impressive, I mean, when you look at that. And so they combine these two, uh, these two activities. Another, another uh, combination uh, could be, for instance, um, the protection of nature. So to have a marine protected area and to allow some activities there uh, carefully managed and planned, uh, such as diving, for instance. Uh, I know I am from Spain, and I know that there are places in Spain off the coast of, uh, um, in the south, in the southeast of the coast of Murcia, where you have a um, marine protected area where diving is allowed, and this works uh, very well. So these are two examples of such, uh, I mean, synergies between two, two uses of the sea. Thank you, Juan. Those were great examples. Um, our next question is, um, I think we'll ask this one to um, Mandy, uh, which is earlier today in the plenary session on blue economy for post-pandemic recovery, it was mentioned that marine spatial planning is absolutely key to the success of the blue economy since it regulates the use of coastal and marine areas where sometimes there are different uses that compete and conflict. Um, because you talked about a systems approach, um, I think this question is good for you, which is how can environment, biodiversity, protection and restoration be balanced out against the pressing needs for economic growth and job creation? Yeah, so um, let me start to answer that by saying that I don't like the use of the word balance um, because I am of the opinion that society 
cannot function unless our oceans are healthy. So I like to think of it very much as um, at the foundation of clean and healthy systems, not just marine systems, but global and earth systems. And on top of that, we can live off that interest by um, having a society that wants to govern itself in however it wants to govern itself, be that in economic growth or, or circular economy models. But if there's not a foundation that is a clean and healthy system, then none of that stuff at the top can actually happen. So I don't subscribe to the view that we need to balance. I subscribe to the view that we need to live only of the interest and not bite into the capital. I also don't subscribe to the view that, you know, there's a social pillar and an economic pillar and an environmental pillar. I believe that there's a foundation. And I think that um, the, the COVID epidemic now has shown us exactly what can happen if we don't have healthy systems. And, you know, the, the, I mean, it's, it's like brave new world, you know, 1984, Aldous Huxley, or in 1984 is when I read the book. I don't know when he wrote it, but I kind of feel that, that we are there already. And um, so the speed with which our planet is starting to topple tells us that this focus on, on growth economies and this focus on, on a balancing act rather than a foundational act um, is theoretically wrong. Having said that, I don't need to manage the planet and I don't need to, to fight for my own breakfast because I'm in the privileged group that can sit and do science rather than worry about where my energy and food come from. So I understand that it's a, something we need to deal with. But I also understand that one typhoon, one hurricane, one flood can, can do so much. Um, certainly in, in Africa and small island developing states where I live, these things are catastrophic. And that, um, you know, turning our mangroves into firewood rather than letting them protect our people is, is really something that we really need to start paying attention to. So the ecosystem services are fundamental. Um, and we need to get those right before we start thinking about growing economies. And we just need to figure out how to do that. Of course, I think if we just stopped having wars, we'd be able to, you know, solve poverty. But that's just because I'm a bit of a radical. So, uh, yeah, some food for thought. And those are just my personal views. Well, some very interesting food for thought. Um, and um, since we are fortunate and enough to have a few government officials um, on, on with us, who they do have to um, look at these, um, whether it's balancing them or using them as a foundation. Let's move to Michelle first and see what uh, her thoughts are on that question. Thank you, Sally. And thank you, Jose Moutinho, for this question. And actually, I think it's a very important question. And for answering this, I'd like to go back to the MSP definition that we mentioned at the beginning of the, the session. Because we usually say, okay, we need to have uh, economic objectives, environmental objectives, and social objectives. And I can tell you from some trainings, MSP trainings that I, I have been delivered with uh, the team of IOC UNESCO. And usually when you ask the stakeholders to think about it, they really think in each box and it's not only about thinking of each box, but how to integrate and negotiate all these different objectives in a planning process. So it's not, it's not, and how do you solve these conflicts? You need to establish the priorities of your planning process. And you need to establish these thinking about the needs of the area. So for example, if you want to, at, uh, have, if you have as a driver, for example, the development of renewable energy for climate change, that it's not, this is not only an economic objective, this is also an environmental objective, and this is also a social objective. And, but at the same time, you cannot have all this space for this activity because you have other priorities too. For example, to ensure food security. And then you also need to think about, for example, uh, fisheries and aquaculture, and they are not only economic, they are also environment and social objectives. So maybe if we start to think about these objectives in, as the three 
levels, as the three aspects they have, maybe we'll be able to negotiate them better and to have a better idea about the priorities of the area we are planning, because it's not general. Thank you. Um, that, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't know, Juan, you had raised your hand. I don't know if you want to add anything to it. Uh, why don't you add something and then we'll move on to our next question after. Yes, thank you. But the, what I wanted to say is, about, I, I fully agree with Mandy on the fact that we we, we need a healthy uh, ocean. But uh, I think you can do you can do things perhaps uh, at the same time. So you may you may develop some economic activities uh, in the marine environment, but you may also do something from the environment. Uh, so it's not only about preserve or conserve, but to regenerate. To, to, for instance, to build with nature. I mean, uh, mangroves can be a fantastic uh, tool to avoid uh, coastal erosion. So you can do, I think, both same things together. So uh, I would look at the problem from that perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so our next question is a little bit more specific. Um, and um, it may be for Tammy or, or others, um, but it's really asking, um, <clears throat> excuse me, how does marine spatial planning work in rapidly urbanized coastal zones? You know, Bermuda is, is facing that and um, others may have witnessed it, whether it's the cross-border situation that March is working on or our government officials. Um, but let's start with Mandy, I mean, with Tammy, excuse me, if you, yeah, that's a great question. As, as I said in my presentation, our reef platform is where most of our activity is happening at the moment. It's only 750 square kilometers. So you have a lot of users that, you know, feel that their activity is uh, most important. And, uh, but we're a small, small island. Um, and so this is why we, we have developed these, these focus groups to really you know, get people, experts in those in those fields, um, you know, in those industries to to really participate in in the in the process as much as possible, giving their objectives because it's key. They're I mean, they're really key into into solve you know helping to negotiate and and uh, work out uh, a viable plan for this small area. Thank you for that, Tammy. Um, you know, I, or, okay, Marta, would you like to comment on that as well? Yes, yeah, just a short, short comment. Okay, uh, I agree on that. Also here in the Azores, um, we are not uh, highly uh, or densely populated. Um, and my feeling from the project and from the stakeholder engagement process that we developed, um, I do believe that stakeholders are um, available to, to find common solutions and to find the best way with to deal with the, those questions. So I do believe that engaging people uh, will actually benefit all the process. Yeah, that's um, that's really true. I mean, from our own work here at the Stimson Center, we have um, a project called the Climate Ocean um, uh, Resilience uh, Vulnerability Index. And we are really looking at an integ integrated approach focusing on cities. Um, and you have to look at all of these issues because that's the real world. You can't just look at, you know, the science by itself or the social issues or the economics. You, you really have to integrate all of them. 